Greetings, folks. Welcome to another one of our Free Friday Community classes right here on the YouTubes. I post these every single Friday, so if this kind of content flips your switches, please hit the subscribe button. Let me know you're out there, and you'll get a little ding every time a new class goes up. So February, somehow, is just around the corner, really uh, sneaking up on me this year. And in the wheel of the year that I practice, which is purely agricultural, February 1st marks the beginning of spring. I know that where a lot of us are, me included, uh, February doesn't really feel very spring-like, but if we pay attention, we can actually find the stirrings of the springtime energy trying to emerge. So in the particular way that I walk the wheel of the year, I really acknowledge and honor four festivals, which uh, in the neo-pagan world we might call the four Celtic fire festivals. I don't really acknowledge very much, uh, unless I'm celebrating with other people, the cross-quarter days. So the solstices and equinoxes, which are really astronomical, uh, they're solar-based observances, uh, those aren't on my radar quite as much. But the agricultural ones, very much uh, my speed, very much what I'm into. So for me, February 1st is when I transition my work from the winter quarter into the spring quarter and it's big time of year and a lot of people struggle with February 1st rather than the spring equinox because again it's not as easy to see but if you think about what we should be doing from a planting perspective in that first couple of weeks of February it starts to make sense because that's when we will be preparing seeds and planning our beds and all of that. So a couple of ways that I honor the season. Um, as you know by now, my work is not particularly ceremonial. I'm very folksy and very intuitive in the way that I work with the plants. So my rituals are very, uh, I try to make them very heartfelt and, and really leave a lot of room for the plants to respond to what I do. So the first thing that we can start doing uh, as part of our observance of February 1st of the turning of spring of Imbolc, if you will, is to wake and charge seeds. So whether you have a pot on your porch or space in your backyard to garden, or maybe you have an allotment or you're part of a community garden, we, are, we will be nearing the time of year when we're gonna go put seeds in the ground. And there's an invitation here to connect to the potential of seeds. Consider that, um, you know, this tiny little seed, this little tiny little seed, turns into this huge plant, right? A big plant that is filled with magic and medicine and nourishment and fiber and fuel and fragrance and beauty. Like it's, it's pretty magical, if you ask me. Uh, and I try to always remember that. I try not to let it become, you know, uh, commonplace because it's easy for us to lose the magic and the mystery of nature um, when we understand um, how they work. So try to stay connected. So one thing we can do is take the seeds that we're going to be working with. You don't have to do it with necessarily all of them, but especially any plants that you're really excited about stewarding this year. Maybe you're gonna be growing a plant or two that uh, you've sat with in plant, one of our plant spirit journeys over the last year and you're really excited to watch them grow in person. Or maybe there's medicine that you wanna craft or a plant that you feel has been calling out to you or a plant that you're already really close to and you get to grow them for the first time this year or for the 10th time this year. Those are really the plants where this ritual is super important. So I like to take my seeds. This is um, an ancestral red wheat seed and I warm them, right? I kind of get them ready for growing because I think about if they weren't in little seed packets or in jars in my fridge, right? Uh, they would be out under the cold soil. And so part of waking up in the spring is warming up. So I will take the seeds and run them through my fingers and try to mingle my metabolic warmth with them and try to just wake them up. And it's just this very simple, very quick little ritual of, you know, hey, wake up, it's time, right? It's time to get started. And I also feel like my vital force, my energy gets mingled with the energy of the seeds and it connects us, right? And, and some of my intent 
and the desire that I have to steward them and connect with them goes in there. So that's one level. The other thing you can do is that if there are things that you are working on, maybe health stuff, you know, physical wellness things, mental wellness things that you're working on, and maybe one of the plants or several of the plants you're bringing into your garden or your, your pots this year are plants that are appropriate for you to work with in that case. Or maybe you're working on, you know, boundaries or feelings of protection or calling love into your life. And so you've chosen some plants to grow that can, you know, their their sphere of influence is over those places and they can help you with that. Um, this is an opportunity to take those seeds and, you know, charge them. Um, put your prayer, your, in, your petition, your intent into those seeds. What I like to do is uh, first, you know, call out to the plant spirit. And I have classes here on the YouTube on how to invoke and how to pray to plant spirit. So you can go watch those ones. Um, I call them, I invoke them. I flatter them, I ask them for their help, and then I visualize myself or my clients or my community uh, in the state that I'm hoping they'll attain through working with this plant, right? So maybe if I'm growing a plant to help people with stress and anxiety, I imagine the people in my community feeling strong, calm, centered, resilient, and adaptable. And I move that from my heart center, down my arms, out my hands, and into the seed. And I place that intent with the seed so that as the plant grows, they're carrying my prayer with them. They know we have a goal. We have a mission to accomplish together. Remember that plants are always conspiring to bless the human animal uh, and to bless the world, right? That they're uh, invested in our wellness. So sometimes more than we are, interestingly. Uh, so don't hesitate to put these kinds of prayers and petitions. So warm and wake, uh, warm and charge your seeds. Next thing is a ritual of warming the soil. This is something I do every year. I go out really early in the morning on February 1st. There's always frost on the ground. It's uncomfortably cold out. We still go out barefooted. Uh, don't tell any of my uh, traditional Chinese medicine practitioners that I do that because they'll scoff we go out barefoot and we warm the soil. So again, if that means a local park for you, if that means your backyard, if it means a community garden, I really think about warming the soil of the place where you're going to plant plants or where you're going to spend time sitting under trees or, or hiking. Like do this in a place where there's connection for you, right? Not all of these rituals around February 1st have to be about planting. Not all of us have access to spaces or the ability to do that. Uh, but this one, you know, make it about a place that's special to you. So we take out hot tea, hot coffee, uh, hot whiskey, you know, or a hot rum drink, warm fluids, and we take out beeswax candles and we take out uh, matches. And sometimes we kindle a small bonfire, um, just a little one that we can kindle right on the soil. And we pour those drinks and offering to the land and to the land spirits and to the earth goddess. And we light a couple of candles and we do the bonfire. And sometimes we bring out warm herbs. Uh, we'll make little patterns with cayenne and clove and black pepper and ginger. And we warm the soil, right? We start sort of waking everybody up and saying, hey, the sun's coming back. It's starting to get time to wake up. Um, you can also do something as simple as, you know, generating heat in your palms and putting your palms on the soil and staying there until that soil starts to warm up. So it's us participating in the cycle. Uh, are we responsible for warming the soil and waking the seeds? No, not at all. Um, but when we align to this thing that's already happening, this concept of human exceptionalism, of being outside of or dominant over or needing to take care of in order for nature to be okay, it starts to dissipate. And we realize nature does its own thing on its own and that we're part of it and that we can participate in it. So even very simple thing like going out and putting your warm hands on the soil brings you back in and psychologically spiritually it's very good for us but also 
if you are interested in, in doing plant spirit path work, right, which is my path that I walk, a plant spirit path, uh, this is a really great way to show them that you're interested, that you're serious, that you want to participate, that you want to be part of, that you want to be initiated into those ways. Um, one other thing that I do that kind of uh, leans on an old English tradition of Candlemas is that in addition to lighting a couple of beeswax candles uh, as an offering to the land, we also take out a bunch of beeswax candles and lay them uh, around that bonfire, around that space uh, to bless them and to catch the emerging warmth of the spring and then we use those candles throughout the rest of the year. Uh, it doesn't matter how many I buy, um, I always run out before the end of the year. Every year I add a little bit more thinking this will be how many I need and it never works out. But it's the thought that counts, right? Uh, so moving on, another really good thing, especially if you have a private garden or uh, access to a tree that provides you with food or medicine, maybe an apple tree or an apricot tree or linden or pine, that we go out uh, usually the night before February 1st, so the last day of January, and cause a ruckus. Uh, do what in Southern England they would have called in the, you know, sort of early 1500s, a howling right. Um, light uh, a couple firecrackers, just a couple. Um, bang pots and pans, shake bells, rattles, drums, scream and shout. And this really fun ritual is actually about chasing away the darkness, chasing away inauspiciousness, chasing away any malefic or uh, disharmonious energy patterns that have taken the opportunity of the cold, still winter to settle in. We're, we're like rustling them up and chasing them out. So that should be in your heart. That should be the sentiment that even though these howling rites are fun and they're usually alcohol fueled, um, we shouldn't forget that we're there to do our part. We're there to do something magical for the land, for the trees, to bless them, to protect them, um, to do something for them, right? Because they do so much to us. So as part of that howling ritual, we also wassail the trees. And I know that uh, some of my friends in the UK will have their hackles up over this because the traditional time to wassail trees is around 12th night or like 17th of January. But I wait until February 1st or the last day of January um, to do this because where I live, it makes sense. And I think that if we go further back into the pag you know, pre-Christian pagan worship of trees, this is closer to the time when it would have made sense. So it's only like 10 days off. Um, but this makes more sense to me. Plus we can do everything together. So what do we do? We take out bowls or chalices, right? It's my green man chalice. We take out chalices of cider, uh, spiked cider, you know, put a little whiskey or a little rum in there. And we pour libations to all of the tree spirits, uh, especially those that feed us, especially those that give us shade, especially those that we harvest medicine from. Um, if you don't have anything like that where you live, pick, you know, a tree that brings you joy. Pick a tree that grows in your on your street or your front yard or in a local park and go out and, you know, toast that tree to their health, to their wellness with gratitude and love and pour a little bit of the cider or the drink at their roots. And uh, then you can pass that around and share with each other and it brings you into communion with that plant and it uh, is a way to celebrate them and wake them. And we also will follow the old uh, traditions of either bringing uh, toasted bread to lay around the roots of the plants or sometimes if there are low branches, you can sort of poke a hole in the toast and hang it over the branches of the tree. and. This is not only an offering to the tree spirit, but it's actually on a deeper level. We are putting food into the canopy of the tree, which symbolizes the fruition of the universe, right? The world tree, the tree is symbol of the cosmos. And so we are 
sort of doing this ritual of providence, saying, I feed you that you may have enough to feed everyone. So there's this really beautiful, compassionate aspect to it. And also, as the animals start waking up, right? Sometimes they have a rough go those first few weeks getting enough food. So uh, we put the bread there that they can snack on, the squirrels and the birds and the raccoons can snack on. Uh, and we also try to be mindful to bring out bird seed and uh, different, you know, veggies that we can put in those places so the animals have enough food to survive. Um, this is just us participating, you know, doing what we can because we can, because we have thumbs, uh, we can put our thumbs to work. So the wassailing ritual, you can get a few friends together, light a bonfire, make a party of it, or it can be a more personal, private, solemn uh, thing. I've done it both ways. I enjoy both of them this year. Uh, might be a little more of a party. It feels feels like that's uh, what we should do. So uh, I've wassailed evergreens and apple and apricot and pear and linden and hawthorn. Um, you know, you could choose who you're going to wassail this year just based on who you're working on or who you feel you felt close to over the last year. But uh, make it nice. And one bit of folklore that I'll leave you with is, uh, again, from kind of the south of England, early 1500s, this concept of the apple tree man, which you already know is right up my street. And the apple tree man would have been the oldest or largest apple tree in an apple orchard, right? Apples, very, very important in Celtic mythology and very, very important in English plant lore. So the oldest, maybe the first tree planted or the one that got the like bigger than all of the other ones that has this energy of being kind of the leader, you know, or the, the grandparent plant. Um, it was understood that when the winter came, and all the, you know, or when the autumn came and all the leaves died back and all the remaining fruit dropped off and the trees went into hibernation, that the apple spirit, right, the spirit of all apple trees would take up residence in that oldest tree, in that biggest tree, and would be called the apple tree man. And this tree then in the, in the apple grove would, it would be obligatory, compulsory, to toast, to wassail and feed and make offerings, to sing songs and kindle a bonfire for that tree. Because it was understood that the actual apple tree spirit who resides in all apple trees across time and space um, had taken up a special residence in that tree and could be honored and petitioned to come back. And that if uh, the apple tree man was properly petitioned and given offerings that the apple harvest would be good. So don't let that, you know, get stuck in apple trees because I think that you can do it with all the trees, right? If you have one uh, lime blossom tree or linden tree that uh, is biggest or best or favorite to you, that that tree can be approached to honor all, you know, the linden spirit rather than individual linden spirits. So a great story, a reminder that we've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, plant spirit work, the way I practice it, the way I teach it, the way that we talk about, it's nothing new. Uh, of course, I lean into my green gnosis a lot because I'm very heavily invested in this work and I get lots of teachings from the plants that are for the here and now. But ultimately, pretty much everything we talk about, we can trace back uh, to our ancestral plant lore traditions, which I think is very cool. So with that, I will send you out to make a couple of simple heartfelt plans for the upcoming uh, celebration of the beginning of spring, the ending of winter, February 1st. Let me know in the comments below what you think you might do this year if you want to try something or if you've already got an established holiday or maybe you follow uh, traditional uh, in bulk festivals or you work with the goddess Brie. Uh, tell me what you do. What what do you got going on? And with that, uh, I'll send you out with blessings of peace and plenty for the budding spring. See you next week.